All right, everyone. Hello. Today, we have a very, very special episode, a little, little different from what we usually do from Anything's Possible. Uh, today, we are joined by a uh, wonderful game director, full, and a wonderful human that has worked on a lot of exciting games, such as Legacy of Kane, Eternal Darkness, and is now currently working on Dead House Sonata with Apocalypse Studios. Everyone, Dennis Dyack. Dennis, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for having me. Very excited uh, to be here with you and Lucas, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, very, very excited. I know ever since Lucas and I did Eternal Darkness for the podcast, we've always just been a big fan, and I think Lucas's fandom goes even beyond that as well uh, with some of his experience with your other stuff. So very, very excited. Um, now, just to, to break the ice, one thing we love to ask with anyone we bring on the podcast is, Dennis, what is your all-time favorite game? Oh, it's so tough because uh, there's about 10 of them and they're constantly changing because I'm playing different games all the time. I think it's um, incumbent upon people who create games to try to really know what's out there. And um, But I, I can give you some of the old classics um, and certainly some of the ones that inspired other games and, and I can roll that all the way into Dead House as well. So, um, so... I would say Resident Evil 2 is probably my favorite horror game awesome. of all time. And that inspired Eternal Darkness. And uh, when I mean inspired, um, I'll, I'll, there's a little story behind it where we're doing a presentation with Nintendo. And um, I was flying down uh, to Seattle. And Resident Evil 2 came out two days before. And it's like, instead of, you know, getting sleep and working on the pitch, I stayed up all night for two days in a row and completed Resident Evil 2. <laughs> and when I got there, <laughs> that is and awesome. when I got, this is a cool story. So when I got there, um, the executive producer I was working with, I just started talking about Resident Evil 2. I go, have you played this? You get story from two sides. It's really crazy. And he's like, I know. And he's like, he looked at me, he goes, you look like hell. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't sleep. I just played that stupid game. And he's like, oh man. And, and, and he, and then we talked for another couple hours and he was like, you know, um, we should do something like Resident Evil. I go, that would be amazing. Except we'll do it differently. We won't create a survival horror. We'll do something with much more story and we'll talk about Lovecraft and, and, and he's like, let's do it. So we never did that pitch. And then instead I, I went back and then a week later came back again and then pitched Eternal Darkness and it was greenlit. That's the story. Wow, that is, yeah, that is awesome. What year was that? Um, Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2. So 98. that was, oh man, 98. Was diapers. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So Eternal Darkness originally started its production from what I understand on the N64. Um, and then of course it, it came out in the game on the GameCube in 2002. So what was it like to pivot from that original pitch on the 64 then into the Nintendo GameCube? Right. Um, yeah. So um, when we were originally working with Nintendo, the first thing we did were these technology tests because they're very picky on who uh, they want to work with. And working on a cartridge is very hard. It's actually much harder than working on a modern day console because you're so memory restricted. And so we did a bunch of tests and, um, you know, by time, uh, you know, Eternal Darkness was approved for Nintendo, um, we started working directly on the N64. And the goal was that we wanted to run in 640 by 480, which was high res back in those days, you know, for, for a cartridge. And back then you had to use that extra memory slot, but we didn't want to do that. So uh, we actually spent the time and did a crazy optimization where we were running high res without the memory cartridge. And actually, I remember a meeting we had where people couldn't even believe it was running. They thought it was fake. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was a massive technical achievement. And we were so happy with it. And even back then, in those days, um, there was this process with the Nintendo that's fantastic. And I love these guys for it. And, the treehouse everyone knows is kind of like PR, but what they also do is they test internally to see how good they think the games are going to do. And we got rated really, really well on the N64. Plus, we had this crazy high res running without the memory cartridge. So 
we felt we would sell more copies because people, you know, not everyone bought one of those memory cartridges. And so as we're development, developing it, everything's going well. And then suddenly, with nothing to do with us, Nintendo decides that they don't want to manufacture cartridges anymore. They want to go all to the GameCube. It's a better piece of hardware, which it was by far. The N64 was awesome, but the GameCube, still one of my favorite consoles of all time, has this new uh, you know, disc uh, technology. And so we moved everything over. So it was quite hard. It was crazy in the sense that we had this game already that was, I would say around alpha, not quite done, but scoring really high internally with Nintendo. Nintendo really liked it. Running high res without the memory cartridge, doing all kinds of crazy things. Graphically looked really strong. We actually showed it at E3 one year and uh, we scrapped it all and moved it to a GameCube, to the GameCube. And we were doing technology tests for two human on the GameCube. So we wow. already were getting to know the hardware anyway. So um, overall, great transition allowed us to do some very interesting camera stuff. The graphics were improved greatly, but it was very hard on the team because it delayed the game by two years. Um, and um, when you're in the games industry, making video games is very hard. And we, when you get a surprise right. like that, um, it's... Uh, you know, it's just, it's it was hard, but at the same time, completely rewarding, and I would take nothing back. I just think that, I just think that as an experience, um, it was tremendous. And, you know, working with Nintendo, they're like top shelf, really care about video games. And not all people in video games feel that way. There's some people in it for the money. There's some people in it for the prestige. Nintendo, um, you know, certainly cares about money, but I, I think they're in it for the consumer. And ever since working with them, and I always felt this way too, back then, Silicon Knights, uh, we, we, the goal was to be the knights in shining armor in the games industry, uh, to ho hold a vow that we're going to create good software for people. And Nintendo had that same affiliation, but it, when I, after working with Nintendo, all of that gets reflected now in everything we do. We feel as game developers that we work for gamers. And um, I think I think that's becoming a bit of a lost art these days, but I really feel that Nintendo does that. You know, when we're working with Kojima-san, same thing. These guys work crazy hours, not because, you know, they want to get prestigious or prestige or you know, they want to make a ton of money or anything like that because they love what they're doing and they want to create a product that gamers can say, this is great. And yeah, so that is awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, that was that story. So that was the switch anyway. That was the switch <laughs> from the N64 Yeah. Yeah. No, GameCube. no worries. Um, now on, on Eternal Darkness and, you know, for those of you that are just listening, um, we, me and Matt did play Eternal Darkness for the podcast um, for our, one of our Halloween October episodes. And, and we really love the game. And one thing I really love about it is that existential kind of cosmic terror that that's really there, that kind of Lovecraftian theme that's there, mm -hmm. these old gods kind of coming in, humanity really being on the brink of, of extermination, all that stuff. Now, Dennis, you seem to be a pretty family-oriented, level-headed guy. <laughs> Obviously, you're highly educated. Where does this darkness come from? That's a, that's a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, so... Um, yeah, um, I am very interested in researching uh, the unknown, I guess. And uh, I, I'm a, I love ancient history. I love the Cthulhu mythos because it's based on science. And if you look at uh, Through the Gate of the Silver Key by Lovecraft, um, it really, he's almost literally quoting Einstein and quantum mechanics in the block universe theory. And these, I think, um, titanic authors have, have a way of moving us in ways that are profound. And I, I believe, and I'm a huge horror fan, um, I believe that it's our one of our objectives as creators to to give people an experience that changes how they 
feel about things. And, and to be clear, I'm not talking about an agenda or anything like that. I mean, having people go through an experience, putting themselves in this fantasy world where then they can then draw something out of it, a catharsis, where it changes the way they feel about things. And um, I know that as an example, with Eternal Darkness, one of the things that I was really happy one of the things I'm most proud of with that game, and I think there's a lot of great things in there and there's just huge experiences, but if you play the game three times, we actually work in gameplay into the narrative from a quantum mechanics yeah. perspective, a parallel universe. And that, if we can get people to think, well, wait a minute, if there are parallel universes and all this is going on, what does that mean? And, you know, obviously this is a, a dark fantasy game, but um, the uh, goal is, is to, get, to get people to look up to the stars and imagine. And that's what I think Lovecraft does. Now, the, the dark side of things, um, sorry, this is my cat. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <he> <laughs> that perfect a, perfect a pro, timing with the dark. You're about to go into the dark stuff. Podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, there's a whole story with cats, but um, the I think I think in general when it comes to dark things, um, I think I think that underlying fear of the unknown, which Lovecraft is so famous for, you know, discussing and exploring, I think is 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 part of human nature that is the most challenging, and I like challenging things. So I, I guess that's why I lean towards it. Like take take Apocalypse. So Silicon Knights, Knights in Shining Armor, very Arthurian, wanted to create a Camelot, sort of the perfect environment, um, you know, for gamers. And Apocalypse, a lot of people don't know this, but Apocalypse is actually ancient Greek to reveal the unknown. And a lot of people associate the Apocalypse with revelations and the end of the world. But it's actually meant, and even in Revelations, it's meant to reveal a new beginning, a new status of things that is previously unimaginable. So what we want to do with Apocalypse is change the way people play games and take uh, these modern mediums that we understand games like and present it in such a way that gamers go, whoa, I never thought I could get an experience like this. So it's dark. Certainly, Apocalypse is dark, and you know we right. created, you know, the company in 2018, pre-pandemic, had no foresight. Um, so, but during the pandemic, and it's lightening up now, thankfully. Um, there are a lot of people saying "nice company name," and I was like, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's kind of it's the trajectory of um, having Silicon Knights and kind of have that. It sounds more idealistic, whereas Apocalypse, I think, on the ears of people, sounds a little bit less so. Um, but I love that yeah. you've kind of dug deeper into the the real message of what apocalypse means and kind of taken that as as a mission statement almost um, into the company. I, yeah, love that a lot. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, I definitely yeah. would say that. I think uh, Silicon Knights had a certain idealism, uh, probably probably one that was unsustainable um, because the world isn't ideal. Where apocalypse. <laughs> um, a lot of people at the company have been around a long time. We've had a lot <laughs> of experiences now. And I'm happy to say that, you know, some people that I've worked with at, at Silicon Knights are back at Apocalypse, but other people as well, where the depth of experience in the company is staggering, actually. Like people that have been in the industry 25 years plus. I've been in the industry 30 years or more, actually, just a little over 30 now. And uh, I don't know many people. I feel old. But when there's other people <laughs> joining the company with 20 years and 25 years experience, it's it's just awesome. So um, we're really excited on where this is going to take us. And um, I think that I think there's so much opportunity for change. And we'll, we'll talk about that, especially when it comes to narrative in this modern age of gaming, um, that it's it's undiscovered country. No one's really even a start of exploring yet what's going on with all this new tech. So we're excited. I love that. Now I know for me, Dennis and um, any listeners of the pod will know this is true for me. Like some of my favorite game experiences that I've had are these more 
single player focused um, narrative driven games, or at least in my eyes, narrative driven. And I'm thinking of games like um, Oxen Free, uh, Outer Wilds, which I don't know if you have the chance to check it out. You'd love it. Quantum Mechanics is well bound in there. Um, I'm wondering, how do you define a narrative driven game? Is it simply a single player game with a good story? Or is there something deeper? Is it you being able to influence the, you know, uh, the choices of your character in the game? What really pinpoints it for you? A narrative driven game to me is a game where it's a good question, by the way, I've never been asked it before (laughs) is a game where the narrative drives the game and the narrative is important. Does it have to be completely dominant? No, absolutely not. So that doesn't mean, um, you know, where you have some games with almost no game mechanics and it's all like a storybook or something. That's not what I mean. I, I mean, a narrative driven game. I mean, a game where the narrative is extremely important and it is, I guess, would be core to the fabric of that game. If you took away the story, it wouldn't be the same game. So that's what I would define as a narrative driven game. And I think that's great. I guess ever since Legacy of Cain, so all the games that I've pretty much done post Legacy of Cain were narrative driven. So, you know, Eternal Darkness, Metal Gear you know, too human and definitely dead house, dead house Sonata is got some crazy narrative going on. And so I think, um, you know, going back to narrative driven games, there's quite a dearth of no (laughs) narrative driven games these days. So it presents us with an opportunity to do something that, uh, you know, bring a bring a voice back that hasn't really spoken in the yeah. industry in so long. It's been silent. It's been silenced by technology and, uh, you know, macroeconomics. And I could, you know, we can talk about that. Yeah, it's very <laughs> we will. We uh, will yeah, get I into kinda, that. I'm just curious to dive into that a little bit right now. Why do you? Why do you think that is? Because I know we kind of mentioned this in our initial call with you when we were setting this uh, setting this up. But I, I think, yeah. especially if you just go onto like you know, say the YouTube gaming section, right, or Twitch, the front page is going to be apex legends um fortnite valorant csgo what have you um whereas a lot of these other games that are more like you know narrative driven or even just single player games just for that sake you know are really kind of buried a bit more under that why do you why do you think that is is it a monetary thing or is it just that this is what people want to see or is there something deeper going on there um well a couple things um both a combination of both so, and let me explain why. So this is a, this is going to be a super long answer. So hopefully everyone will sit tight and I'll start with the basics. We need to understand if, if you're a gamer listening and you want to understand why there's so many multiplayer games, why there's so many mobile games. It's very straightforward. That's a very simple answer. 90% of all global gaming revenue is free to play games mobile is almost all free to play or a large percentage of it and the console gaming market and the pc market now is dominated by free to play and so if you look at games like call of duty or i don't know any uh god of war that's in the 10 percent range all the other money wow. that's made in the industry 90 percent is all free to play and so just by numbers alone, that is going to, that explains Twitch and, you know, people love esports, So they love the competitive aspects. And then you also have all these, you know, uh, personalities that come on and um, are like YouTube personalities that stream and talk about, you know, either the games itself, the esports, or make fun of games as they play, but you're going to see them, not really the game. And so that's why the market is the way it is. And there is this, quite frankly, the free to play genre is a superior economic model compared to anything else out there. And, you know, it came from Asia, but it's here to stay. And why do I say it's superior? Because it's quite simple. Any free-to-play game, you can play, not spend a penny, and see if you like it. 
And the most recent addition to that is um, Lost Ark, really good example. It's free to play. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to. And that will overcome anything that's that's a better economic model than, say, I don't know, uh, some kind of streaming service where you have to pay a subscription. It's better than any MMO. It's better than any premium because it's free. It costs you nothing, only the download, and you can try it. So that's, in my opinion, that's from an economic model, it's, it's superior, and that's not going to change. So that's the world today. So now that doesn't mean despair. And here's, here's when you look at single player games, I'm going to talk about a problem with the current slate of single player games with narrative driven and why they're not that popular on Twitch, but it's very straightforward. They're not that popular because once you know the story or if you've played the game yourself to experience it again, is not that exciting, right? So right. unless there's a large amount of d- dynamicy in the narrative, which there usually isn't because they're hard to make, um, people are watching it, but it's like watching that movie that you've seen before. That's sort of the problem. So that also makes them less popular, which makes esports, it's like watching a tennis match or a soccer game or a football game. It's, you know, people are there to watch it and you don't know what's going to happen. And that's exciting. And so what does that mean? for single player games and why do I say don't despair? Um, and why are we making a narrative driven game? Cause uh, anyone who knows me knows I, sh- I sure as sure as heck, well, sure as hell, <laughs> uh, I swear. I sure as oh, hell- you can curse on this podcast, that's fine. Yeah, okay. I sure as hell <laughs> don't wanna pick that 10%. I wanna be in the 90%. Um, but as we know, free to play games and narrative are like an oxymoron. And if you go mm-hmm. back and you look at all of my previous games, that are well known and that are narrative driven they're what i would call from the golden era of games so they're single player these games you'd sit in front of your console in front of a tv and the story would come at you um you would pay for that experience you would love it it was it's like a theater with eternal darkness we're breaking the fourth wall but we're telling in-depth stories that go beyond anything that you could see in a television series because Legacy of Kane was 120 hours if you wanted to explore the entire, you know, game. And people will play the game for that long. Um, so we have this medium that's really cool, a very long medium. But then what happened with the industry, and I would say this started to change around probably around 2012, 2014. You know, YouTube exploded, social media started exploding. We then went into a, what I would call the multiplayer era. So we have the golden age where you have the consoles and the single player games and RPGs. You have some multiplayer, but not still not a ton. It's really the predominant games are, you know, single player, whether they're box, like whether they're fighting games, I should say, or racing games or RPGs with big stories. That was it. Now we switch to the free to play market competitive play esports where there's not a story to be found really and um what you're seeing is you know that technology of cloud computing combined with the macroeconomics of free to play which are in my opinion unbeatable you can't beat free um and the other traditional markets of the single player games are becoming commoditized so what's happening now is you're seeing all these multiplayer games and there's a strong calling because people really love story. And, you know, there's a whole psych- school of psychology and actually that weaves into quantum mechanics that we are our history. And we and everything that I am today is because of all the things that have happened to me today. But that's me telling a story of who I am to, y- to you both and to everyone else listening. So story is important. So where do I think we're going? Where's where's all this going? This is going where I think towards metagaming. And what metagaming is, in, in my opinion, is being able to play the game outside the game and taking these new technologies that we have. So it's not, it's more than just free to play now. Now we're talking about cloud technologies. Imagine now that 
we could, and this is what we're doing in Dead House Sonata. We will watch everything that you do in the game. Imagine if we stored that big data up in the cloud, not to sell you more things, but to tell you a story. And we had all of these people playing the game. And uh, Matt is the first person to kill this particular boss. That story <laughs> is stored forever for everyone else to see and to listen to. And imagine now we start taking and creating procedural narrative based upon that information and start creating procedural story and almost like creating the Cimmerillion that, you know, Tolkien made except with millions of people. And then suddenly you have now have this combined experience where people are creating histories and that quote of we are our histories. I actually, uh, learned from a quantum physicist who a theoretical physicist who was talking about Einstein's theory of relativity and how it changed our perception of reality that it's not we're not just 3D objects moving through time that we are our histories and I my thought was well why don't we create a game where we start being our histories in the game so imagine all these things where, where we can start doing things and telling narrative based upon actions of your actions and other stimuli that are coming from the metaverse that are either outside the game. Another example, say, um, say you're watching someone stream Dead Host Sonata on Twitch. Well, we happen to be working on this technology that will allow you to play the game without even having it. So what we'll do is we'll embed code technology bits into the stream so you can literally click a link and start playing the stream not the game but the stream and then wow. suddenly you have people who are watching on twitch on their phones could be on a console could be on a pc probably on their phones suddenly are interacting with your game in real time now imagine all that coming together we're saving all this persistence up in the cloud now we can tell stories that you've never experienced before that are going to be dynamic. And all those problems that we talked about, the free to play is overcome. The ideas of people not wanting to watch narrative driven games on Twitch because they know the story. Well, that's not going to happen because you don't know what's going to go on in an environment like this. So the idea of this is let's bring this voice back, this let's bring people back to the early days of the Greek theater where the audience could participate, get up on stage, tell the actors whether a player lived or died. These are what Apocalypse wants to bring to the table to change the way people are playing games or experience games. And then at the same time, I think, bring that voice back that was lost so long ago with the classic golden era games. You know, Legacy of Kane or Eternal Darkness are games that I've made. But there's so many other narrative driven games that I've loved that I wish would come back. And that's kind of the goal and what we're all working yeah. towards at Apocalypse right now. So anyway, long gotcha. answer to the question, but that's that's the <laughs> that's, question. I, that's some of the most no, it's some of the most creative game dev talk we've heard in a very long time, honestly. It it sounds like, you know, you're thinking in terms of collaborative fiction, a whole world that's being procedurally generated, cloud based, community driven, all that stuff. Yep. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of game dev talk usually involves mechanics that are within um, the world itself or balance patches and things like that, whereas you're kind of really taking that narrative approach. It's it's really, really cool. Oh, now, thanks. Thanks. My, I, I, have my, a, I have a theory. I know I'm talking a lot. No, sorry, that's, that's why we're here. No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're here to hear you talk. So I, I talk about this a lot, um, and I, I did this talk right after – Blood Omen Legacy of Cain, actually, I, I did a talk called Engagement Theory. And it it really focuses on, you know, what's the most important thing in gaming. But there's a thing that I was lucky enough uh, when I did my master's in comps. I have a com computer science background and I'm known for writing and I love writing. I love being creative, but I've got a comp sci, uh, you know, honors degree. And then I went on to do a master's degree in uh, user interface and artificial intelligence with neural networks. And wow. I had two supervisors, one a, a computer scientist and a mathematician and another a cognitive psychologist. And we, I was privileged enough to really talk about where, what happens 
uh, what happens, you know, to to gaming, to the industries. And another good friend of mine, um, who's also uh, uh, he's 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 a film critic. He he works with us at Apocalypse, but he's also been able to really tell very interesting stories about the history of film. And it's got to do with what you just said. And let, let me describe it this way. When film first broke out this new technology, first of all, no one thought it was an art, just like at the beginning of video games, no one thought it was art either. Um, they thought it was all technical and the people who could cut the film the best and splice it together the most and do the best special effects dominated the industry for the first 10 years. And the whole idea of understanding the technology of moving pictures, of actually having still pictures moving very quickly through a lens to give you the illusion of movement, um, that was the core of the entire movie industry. As a matter of fact, um, there was no start times for films. You would just walk in for a while and it would just constantly loop and you could walk out. There were no showings, there were really no mm -hmm. stories. And then something changed. After a while, that core mechanic of understanding um, the medium of film um, became displaced by story, narrative, and stars, and actors, and creativity. I think the same thing is happening with video games, and I think it's a very common trap for game designers to think that game design is the most important factor in video games. And that's part of the talk that I do. I say to them, what is the most important thing? And everyone thinks it's gameplay by default. And gameplay, don't get me wrong, gameplay is very focal um, to video games. However, it's not the most important aspect. As a matter of fact, what's the most important aspect is engagement. How are you engaged? And engagement theory um, is something that uh, is a deep psychological st a study by a professor called Dr. Zigzant Mahai, who studied the whole concept of flow, of getting into the moment where accountants or um, you know, athletes that are Olympians, how they would lose track of time um, and get into the flow, into the groove. That's what you want to achieve in a video game. And you can do it through story. You can do it through gameplay. You can do it through art. Right. You can do it through audio and sound. You can do it through anything. And so the, a common trap and why I bring this up is you need to understand the medium. And by understanding the medium and what's important uh, is really going to allow you to get closer to the target you want to hit. And, and this rolls back into Apocalypse. Apocalypse is now looking at the industry. And when you look at where it's going, now that with the market has changed and everything is in the cloud, everything's moving to the cloud. And I don't mean games that are only being played in the cloud. I mean being able to use cloud storage. You know, if quantum entanglement ever happens, then we're going to get reduced lag and <laughs> latency to zero, which people are currently working on. All of these things could come together but the idea is, if you know what that is, let, why not, let's start creating games around that. And um, I think if you focus too much on the central core of game design, just purely game design, you can do it, but don't overemphasize that because there's so many other paintbrushes you can use to create and engage people. And so that's why um, often when I'm looking to talk to someone in the industry that always catches my attention is when they talk something beyond game design. It's very important. I'm not, it's central to making a good game. However, it's not the most important thing. It could be something else. And uh, anyway, so that's why I yeah. speak like this. Wow. It's, it's um, a passion for trying to um, move the industry forward in a way that hopefully others will follow because uh, the golden rule that we have at Apocalypse is in entertainment, you never know if you're going to please anybody. You just don't. You Some games you make people like, some games they don't. And so what you can do is at least create something that you want to play yourself and you're guaranteed to please one person. And if other people start creating games like we're creating, because we love these games, we want to see these games come back and we want to present it in a way that others can also create games so we can play them. That's kind of the goal, the sort of subtle, subversive goal that we'd like to get out there yeah. to the video game industry and other video game developers. So, 
So, well, I love everything you just said. You know, in, in terms of engagement, I will say personally, and I know Matt can probably speak the same. We've talked about it on the podcast before is um, there are times where the story really takes center stage over game design. And that is kind of the thing that's engaging us the most. Um, Eternal Darkness obviously comes to mind. Um, Outer Wilds comes to mind, Matt. I'm not sure if you agree. Um, o- Return of the Obra Dinn is kind of, the very, kind of very similar in that regard as well. Um, now, my question to you is, um, now, Dennis, you, you seem to be really into, um, well, you're really into story. You say that you do some writing. Um, you like writing uh, your own stories, and obviously Legacy of Cain and Eternal Darkness are very heavy on the story side. Now, how do you marry the idea of a procedurally generated story by the community with what you believe the story should be? Um, how do you are you directing the direction of this story um, of Dead House Sonata into the future, or are you simply allowing it to be? That is a great question. Uh, I, I love these questions; they're fantastic. Um, <laughs> okay, so a little bit of background uh, with Dead House Sonata, we're creating a micro platform, or and we're going to allow people to create entire stories, levels, dungeons um, uh, through uh, s- some partners that we have uh, like Project Dios and World Anvil, and we'll import that data into the game and you'll be able to sell it um, you know, for whatever you want. If people wanna buy it, that's great. And um, the idea is uh, we want people to be creative first and not worry about the engine technology, which is really hard. It's really hard to make video games if, uh, and these groups that we're partnered with, uh, you know, they're tools for tabletop gaming. So these are people who like to be dungeon masters, play Dungeons and Dragons or oh, the really cool. tabletop game. Um, so we want to be able to import that data in easily into the game and want people to be able to sell it, promote it, and make cool things. So, but that doesn't answer your question. But I want to get that out there so people understand why we're doing the, the things we're doing. It's going to tie into this. And the best um, example... I can have of why we want to do this and you're going to laugh at first and i love story so i don't hold off on the tomatoes is the game of thrones tv series and it's going to be probably going in a different direction than what you think (laughs) i I, it's a controversial take to mention game of thrones in modern day in regular (laughs) conversation day to day i think these days but it is (laughs) I, i know it is um and um i I have a, I think I have a, a pretty good reason for mentioning it. So please bear with me. Um, no, go for it. So I'm a huge believer, a uh, huge believer. I'm, I'm a huge, I really liked the first four books, first five books. I liked the first three books in Game of Thrones. So I was adamantly reading it and gave it to everyone in the company and said, look, everyone, you need to read these book series. It's really, really cool. And then when the, the Game of Thrones series came on TV, uh, I was blown away. I thought, wow, that was great. It doesn't capture everything in the books. The books are still better, but this is really good. And then what started happening in Game of Thrones, which is really what inspired why we want to do the user-generated content like the way we do, is YouTube channels started popping up. And these YouTube channels started putting theories and stories out of the game. Uh, sorry, of the story, not of the game, of the series, and all all those. Yeah. Kind of I watch things. those. I I watch plenty <laughs> of those YouTube channels myself. Me too. It was yeah. a cottage industry, right? It it came out of nowhere, and so a lot of people think by the time you got to the eighth season, the eighth season, totally crashed and burned. Awful. It was awful. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. what is going on? And so the rumors are, of course, that the showrunners wanted to move on to do something with Star Wars. The cast was tired. They wanted to leave. Everyone has been too long. Uh, George R.R. Martin did not finish the books. Uh, That was really bad. They had no material to work off of. And I'm not going to argue with any of those. But I don't think, I think there's an alternative so I don't want to discredit those because I think they could be valid, but I don't know. I don't know any of the background. That's all rumor, whatever, right? We do know what the end result was, which was bad. But I think something else happened that no one anticipated. And it's, I can't, I can only look at it by focusing at the medium again. For the first time, you had thousands, eventually millions of people all saying, 
this is what I think is happening in the story. What if this happened? What if that happened? What if this happened? I think it was the, after the fourth season at some Comic-Con, George R.R. R. Martin was saying, they're starting to guess what I'm writing. Some of these ideas are better than the ones I'm coming up with myself. And rather than embrace that, they fought it. And they try to subvert everyone's expectations. And what ended up happening is there was just a massive canvas of a million people. And most of the ideas at first were terrible. But then after a while, the good ideas had gravity. And then those good ideas, other people jumped upon it. Like right. SDP is a really good example of community c- collaboration. If you haven't seen uh, SCP, I recommend people check out some of the videos that are online in YouTube. It's very Lovecraftian, and it's it was a PhD project where people tried something collaborative in writing, and it's really really cool. They but going back to Game of Thrones, they they fought it rather than embrace it, and then they ended up coming up with these incredibly awful ideas because they were trying to sur- surprise people, and the only surprises that were possible were just so bad that no one would ever right. contemplate they would actually do it. So rather than embrace that, they fought it. And so when it comes to um, creating detailed stories, I've done that a lot in the video gaming industry. And um, I think doing it again, we're going to try, of course, we always want to make, we're going to do construct something, which what I would say the spinal column of Dead House Sonata. But if we become popular enough, and hopefully that will be the case, and we have All of these people contributing to the content, trying to make it better. Will there be bad ideas? Yes. But will there be a core group of ideas that get so good and that people get so good at making some of these that they eventually become as good or better than what we would create? We would love and embrace that. And I think that is the future of writing. That is the metaverse in a sense. So imagine that we write these stories and then other people contribute to them like say star wars fandom some of those stories were awesome right and there is a another theory of course when you look i'm a big fan of shakespeare I used to quote you know shakespeare uh sort of philosophies for legacy of cain where shakespeare would write very dirty jokes for everyone in the front rows and very cerebral metaphors for the aristocracy in the balconies that's how we wrote Cain to be at many levels like Shakespeare uh, did. Well, a lot of people think Shakespeare was a group of people, not a single person, because it's so detailed. And, right. You know, when I was Led going, by Sir Francis Bacon. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and when I was going through high school, I hated it. But then after, you know, after I started writing, you know, I guess several years after university, I started realizing how amazing that writing was. And you know, realizing that I don't know if I'll be able ever be able to get to there in my lifetime, regardless of how much I try. And then I realized when we started looking at all these things with the new medium and persistence, I I was like, well, wait a second. I don't think that I could create a Cimmerillion like Tolkien or something as detailed as Shakespeare. But if a million people were creating that with me, I think we could. And so that is the idea of where we're going to take the story and why we're doing it the way we're doing it. And um, it's undiscovered country. Do do I know it's going to work? Nope. Am I excited? <laughs> and do I think it is the potential is amazing? I think the potential of you know many many people creating things in the universe is unstoppable and better than any team and. You look at some games that launch AAA games that are free to play. People burn through them in 30 minutes because there's no story. This even helps solve that yeah. problem, mm-hmm. right? So I think there's a lot of potential here, and that's why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, love your answer, and I love the circling, circling it back to Game of Thrones. Um, now, my, my next question actually is kind of in line. I'm glad you brought up Game of Thrones because I was going to bring this up on my next question. Now, um, you seem to really have an affinity for the anti-hero. Um, I did a little bit of research. I saw that Unforgiven was a, a really big inspiration for some of the early work, yeah. um, you know, really with Legacy of Cain. And um, now, 
with the anti-hero conversation, um, one that hasn't been a big thing in video games traditionally and has become more of a tradition lately, but also in pop culture as a whole, the anti-hero has really become very um, trendy, I guess we could say, very popular again, yeah. like in case with uh, Game of Thrones. Now, yeah. where do you think anti-heroes lie in video games and how do you think that informs you, the pop culture or is this sort of um, informing each other? Uh yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So, but certainly back in the day when we did Legacy of Kane, there were no anti-hero games. I don't think I couldn't think of. I can't think of any. I think we were one of the first, if not the first. And certainly when we did Eternal Darkness, Lovecraft was pretty much unknown. It was very fringe. Um, now it's part of pop culture. Everything, everyone knows Cthulhu. Totally. Now. Yeah, it yeah. kind of makes me sad. Um, I kind of liked it when <laughs> it required it required s some research. Uh, now S it's kind of SCP is kind of like that now. Um, so I think to answer your question that it's going to get played out and um, it's going to get tired, and I I believe. But I believe that's not why I created the anti-heroes that we created. Um, well, certainly Kane was an anti-hero with two human. We're telling, retelling the story of Norse mythology through a dead god, Baldur, um, and the story of Ragnarok. So that, that he was, I guess, maybe an anti-hero, not really. And certainly Alex wasn't. So what I think what we tried to do is break i love aristotle i love aristotle's poetics but the three act story uh that for like is dominant in hollywood where i can see like the first act and predict how the third one is going to end almost every time because every character they have all these rules that they follow we were always trying to break that like i loved movies but i'm like I'm tired of predicting all of these things. And there are there back in the day, there were things like Babylon five that broke that, you know, certainly Tolkien. Um, he didn't follow the three act narrative. And um, so I think the anti-hero thing is going to get burnt out with dead house. It might seem that it's anti-narrative, but that's, it's not exactly what's going on. Now, certain, certainly, Certainly, I, I definitely, you're playing the undead fighting the living, and it's a pretty grim universe, of m probably the most grim that we've created. And it's very, you know, it's a spiritual successor to Legacy of Cain, so there's going to be some pretty dark content in there, uh, probably darker right. than Cain. But I, I guess when you look at Legacy of Cain, comparables, um, The Unforgiven, which I thought was an amazing movie, First time I understood that Clint Eastwood could direct and not just act. And I was a huge Clint Eastwood <laughs> fan already by then. Um, but there were other books like Elric and, you know, the multiverse. That was very inspirational for Kane. And if you look at, uh, if you look at Kane, he looks like Elric, you know. Um, so some pretty big homages there. Um, and the other one was Wheel of Time, believe it or not, where um, if you look at the opening cinema for Kane and how you're killed at the beginning and all of those kind of things, that's kind of like sort of the nightmare, that sort of nightwear intro to the Wheel of Time where, you know, the male has gone mad and he's killing his own family and that kind of stuff. So, um those were influ influential. So what's what's influencing Dead House today? Well, fast forward past the crash of Game of Thrones, um, where one of my favorite s stories of all time, and is very, it requires dedication, but it's amazing series called Malazan, Book of the Fallen. It's a decology that I started reading it after the third book. Um, and the author promised he'd do a book like every year and they're tomes. They're like 3,000, some 4,000 pages. Amazing series, very much like Game wow. of Thrones, but Book of the Fallen is a reference to Napoleon. 
and what Napoleon did during uh, his wars is anyone who died beside him, he'd write down their names in the book. It was called Book of the Fallen. So it's kind of like a military campaign. It's as dark as Game of Thrones, only it's at a much vaster scale. And wow. um, it's got stories about the gods, war of the gods, war of men. Uh, story is told over 100,000 years. It goes into anthropology. Just amazing. So I cannot recommend that book series enough. So that's an influence, which you can see and imagine that Dead House is going to be big, much bigger than anything else we've ever perceived uh, in a video game. And then uh, Thomas Ligotti. Have, have either of you heard of Thomas Ligotti? No. I have not. Okay, so has anyone ever watched um, True Detective Season 1? It's on my list. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So the Watched writing, it every episode when it came out, every week. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I will only... I only like season one. Forget the rest. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you guys have heard the story, but um, there that first season was plagiarized from Thomas Ligotti in some of his writing really? on quantum mechanics. And, you know, it talks about Lovecraft and the King in Yellow and all those kind of things. Oh, um, wow. But Carcosa and Carcosa, all that. Carcosa, yeah, all of but But so that that's classical works. But actually... Um, a lot of the dialogue was taken from this book called, uh, what's it? Uh, Conspiracy Against the Human Race, I think. Um, I think that was- You're throwing out some that. really cool <laughs> book titles at us right now. I'm loving oh, yeah. all these all, this making a li our list bigger. You got it. So this author, Thomas Ligotti is fantastic. And he writes something called philosophical horror. So it's actually interesting. We we coined philosophical, we, co we coined, psychological horror back in the day because we wanted to separate it from eternal uh story from uh resident evil from resident and, and evil. all those we didn't want to be yeah more body horror. horror right exactly yeah and now everyone talks about survive uh, psychological horror all the time and i think <laughs> philosophical horror is very very interesting and very different and um you know he he's written great books um yeah conspiracy uh, conspiracy against the human race and um, Grim Scribe and S Songs. I forget. I forget the other book, but fantastic author. I'm, I I shouldn't forget it because I I'm an avid reader. I really like his writing, um, and um, I think that those things are coming together for Dead House. So rather than, I would say, I I guess we can be antihero, but I guess what we are is. Uh, anti-conformist and we're trying to see what we we all stand on the shoulders of giants so thomas Ligotti, he, i think he's one of the greatest writers of our time and i recommend him to everyone and all, also steven erickson uh who's written you know malazan book of the fallen um i, I reckon like these are influences that are creating dead house and where we're taking it so if you look at the old sort of influences for Kane. This is how it's going to affect Dead House. And that's how we ended up where we were with the anti-heroes. So um, it just so happens that there's an anti-hero in this one, but I wouldn't call it uh, anti-hero for anti-hero's sake. It's more of, if we're going to, if we're going to write something dark, we really, I want to be moved like Thomas Ligotti moved me. Like some of his stuff is like, wow. And it's not even graphic. It's just so, it just leaves such a permanent, um, impression on the way i think about horror and different things and malazan book of the fallen is it is a feat of modern literature it's it's, it's considered one of the best stories of all time for fantasy um it's rated usually top 10 amongst all the general polls and stuff so people who have read it love it the problem the problem with the book and uh i think steven erickson is amazing his first book was the roughest um uh the, the concepts were amazing, but the writing was a little rough. And I almost didn't go back to the second book, but I'm so glad I did. After that, he was on fire. And a lot of people have asked him to write that first book, but he's staying true. He's like, nope, not doing it. I, you know, and, um, and it's the first book is called Gardens of the Moon. Um, but it's very interesting. And they talk about, uh, yeah, 100,000 years, uh, anthropology and survival of species over time and what happens to them it's just fantastic all in the fantasy 
all in a war-torn sense with magic and wizards and gods, and it's amazing. So, um, yeah. So anyway, that's why we are where we are with Dead House. And, but, uh, yeah, when it comes to the anti-hero things, getting tired, I think, personally. Yeah, it's like the second anything in pop culture, you know, the second once people realize, oh, some people like this, it gets played out. I mean, honestly, you're kind of seeing that in a sense with, I mean, all the battle royales right now, right, as a genre. I mean, it's not a game, like, <laughs> everyone's trying to make a battle royale these days, right? Everyone's trying to get their piece of the pie and cash in. So definitely just, I think, the yeah. natural ebbs and flows of pop culture there. Um, now, that is something that we always really look at when we play games for the podcast and kind of rate them and evaluate them um, and try and factor into our scores as fairly as we can is, you know, how well does something hold up? You know, how well does this persist over time? And something that really stood out to me with uh, Eternal Darkness is, yeah, obviously, is it a game made out in 2002? Yeah, clearly it is. But that aside, with the uniqueness of the game and the story of the game, it holds up today very well. And it can hold its own against really any AAA game if you understand that it's a game of 2002. So what I'm wondering is when you, as a game developer, and you know this answer may have even changed over time as now we're in a world where patches are a regular occurrence or updates after the fact. But as a game developer, when you're creating your game, is it a major factor or consideration? How is my game going to be looked at five years from now, 10 years from now? You know, how are people going to, are people going to be able to say, yeah, this holds up? Is that something you factor in? Um, no, um, only because back then you would work on a game for like four or five years and then move on to the next one and hope people really liked it. And it was like, a, it's never finished, but you have to let it go. However, um, I think this is going to go back to engagement theory. And we actually did tests on this for Eternal Darkness and why I think it does stand the test of time. Um, so my thesis supervisor, one of them, who's a cognitive psychologist, um, we actually did some focus testing on engagement. We took Dr. Zig Zentmahai. And one of the tests that you can do for engagement is very interesting, is to test to see if people are losing track of time. You ever played that video game? You're up till five in the morning and you think it's only been a half an hour and it's been like six hours. Totally. What happens is you get into flow and you're so into what you're doing that your understanding of time becomes unimportant and time passes very quickly. So what we did is when we were focus testing that game and we kept making changes and we kept asking people what time it was. And the more off that became the better we knew they were being engaged. So I don't think people do many of those tests these days. And you know, for mobile games, it's all about the the cycles and it's more of a Skinner monetize. box. It's yeah, more how, of a Skinner box these days. Yeah, how how fast can yeah. you monetize? And for the AAA games, a lot of people don't understand the way it works and why why we're seeing such problems right now is the traditional companies are trying to move into free to play and crashing and burning a lot. Um, but it's traditionally marketing driven. And so the marketing people say, if it has these check marks, I can spend this much money marketing and therefore sell this many copies. It's actually pretty predictable. The problem with that is, is you don't, it, it cr crushes innovation because people are looking for the same check boxes. So um, when we were working with Nintendo, we were lucky enough where they were development driven and we were doing some things like I remember like the one sanity effect where it was my personal favorite is when we say we're deleting your game. <laughs> the notorious, <laughs> the most famous one really. Yeah. yeah. That, that one though. So I was in a room with Mr. Miyamoto and you know, a lot of other people at Nintendo in Japan and they're like, Dennis, we believe in gamers and, what if we make them get really angry and they throw their controller and break it or smash their GameCube? That's our fault. And, you know, I remember sitting back and going, you know, that's true. It's, I don't know. No one's ever done this before. But if they do do it, they'll remember that for the rest of their life. They will remember that moment when they smashed and that sold it for them. They were like, they sat back and they had the courage to move forward because Nintendo was like, 
if something malfunctions, we got to pay mm -hmm. for it. We owe the consumer. So they were really worried about these things, which quite frankly, I don't think a lot of publishers would give a damn. They would have been like, ah, I don't care. But, you know, Nintendo really cares about those kind of things. Um, and so that's why I think, that's why I think it, it stands the test of time. And, you know, some of those sanity effects, obviously based on 20 year old TVs, that doesn't work so yeah. much. But now there's just so many more things you could do today. Um, you know, if we ever revisit Eternal Darkness, which is a possibility, um, we got some pretty crazy ideas. I love that. And uh, I always, yeah. yeah so, yeah. no, that's great to hear. I, mean, I was in our podcast episode of all the games we played for the podcast, I mentioned that, and even to this day after we've played some more, I, I feel like by far. Eternal Darkness, whether it's um, some sort of sequel, like maybe if Shadows of the Eternal ever comes to fruition, or whether it's a remake of Eternal Darkness, of all the games I've ever played, I feel like Eternal Darkness could benefit the most from a modern day remake and just be so incredible and just just so groundbreaking to everyone. Because, I mean, like I mentioned already, I think everything in that game, particularly obviously everyone loves the sanity uh, effects, I think those are just so groundbreaking. And if they're adapted for you know, modern televisions or modern PCs, there's no reason that those can't be equally as effective today, in my opinion. Totally. Uh, more effective, yeah. really. I, I agree totally. And plus you have all these new technologies that we can immerse people in further. And, you know, like, you know, frankly, there's just more vectors to play with. Back then we were with one person in front of a TV. Now we're out there. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, no. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. I'm I'm glad yeah. I'm glad you both liked it so much. It's that's the best thing as a as a developer uh, is to hear that kind of thing because um, I got into video games. I guess when I was in high school and I was playing. I'm going to date myself. I'm really old, but it was a game called <laughs> Ultima Three, and I was playing it on the Atari ST, and I was stuck. I didn't know where to go, and I stayed up pretty much all night. Um, yeah, I was in high school and, um, there was this, I explored every bit of the world. I didn't know where to go. And there was a stupid whirlpool that would go around and I was in a ship with my crew and we're, I was trying to avoid it. And then one day I got, I was just tired and I just fell into the whirlpool. I just bang, got sucked in. And, um, uh, I was so angry. I thought everyone had died and I was just pissed. I was like, I'm done with this game. And then it went black then opened up into a submerged special continent where I could continue the game. And at that moment, I was, I felt that if I could give that feeling to someone else of a game I made, cause I always wanted to make games, then that's what I want to do for a living. Because that moment I realized I couldn't, couldn't get that from a movie. I couldn't get it from reading a book. And I was an avid reader. I watched tons of movies uh, all the time. And you know, at the end of the day, this was the medium for me. And I was only in high school back then. So, um, and I had uh, three degrees in university still to complete before, you know, before the journey truly began. But, you know, I think that, I think that that kind of feeling is the best kind of thing that you can hear as a game developer, because that's why I started making video games. So, Glad you liked it. Great. Anyway, story for yeah. story uh, for telling so many stories. So <laughs> no, no worries. We we love hearing it. Um, Dennis, uh, my next question. Uh, the the question kind of goes on the opposite end of you know the the idealism behind game development. Um, if you'll indulge me for a second. Sure. Um, it seems today that game developers um, are treated more like servants to gamers rather than the developer being the artist with a real medium. And I, what I mean by that is. You know, gamers clamoring for balance patches or saying, fix your game, fix your game in the comments sections on Steam or the reviews on Steam, getting review bombed, all the negative stuff that impacts um, game developers. Now, how do you think that that culture impacts game developers? Is there anything you would like to say to gamers out there um, to provide some color um, or maybe give them a different perspective as a game developer? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, so probably <laughs> surprisingly, but let me, let me, uh, give you my perspective on this pretty different than most people, you know, um, and I've certainly, uh, I understand, uh, what it's like to get negative feedback. So it's not, that's not new to me. 
I think, again, it comes down to understanding the medium. And so a lot of people misunderstand communication and technology. And uh, I learned a lot of this through uh, one of my heroes, Ursula Franklin. She was a, a physicist. Um, way back in the day, and she, she wrote a book that I recommend everyone read. It's really old now, but it was a, a Massey Hall lecture series called The Real World of Technology and How Technology Affects Us. And so we all have this general perception that technologies allow us to communicate more or better than otherwise we could have, which is actually technically incorrect. What's really happening in a lot of the, the review bombing and the rage can actually be explained through human psychology and phenomena, phenomenon of reciprocity. So as an example, um, if we were doing this together in a single room, it would be a better experience for us all because, you know, we could laugh, we'd probably go out for dinner later, but we could shake each other's hands, we could talk, you would, you see my facial expressions here, but you don't see everything. You don't see what's over here or over here, or if a cat jumps on my lap or, you know, playing at my feet. I'm trying not to get distracted when I talk, but it's not quite the same. And what technology does versus what people, rather than make us communicate better or more, it offers, it offers us different ways or types of communication, but reduced in bandwidth and reciprocity. So as an example, this is good, but not as good as being in person. Calling someone on a cell phone is good, but not as good as having a video call where you can see the person. Texting someone online is better than sending, you know, snail mail or real mail if anyone even does that anymore. Um, because it's instant and happens more quickly. But with each different type of these communications, the amount of bandwidth is reduced, the reciprocity is reduced, where we can freely exchange ideas and you can, you have a better, a more open way of communicating. And what happens automatically with that is frustration and anger builds up. There's all kinds of studies that show this. If you're texting, your frustration and anger will increase. So all of the things that people see out there, all the constant fix your game, you suck. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have said that about eternal darkness. And if I would have read them all and took them all in and said, oh my God, this game sucks, I quit, or start raging at the audience, that would be a big mistake. And, you know, it's very difficult to practice what you preach in this regard. So what I would say to gamers is keep going. <laughs> Give your feedback. If you can help improve our game, please let us know. And it's really hard out there. And I think a lot of people, even modern streamers, like I, I watched Joe Rogan as an example. He doesn't understand this. And he doesn't understand that all of the feedback that he's getting and a lot of the negative feedback is because of the medium. The medium is the message. And when you're communicating through these technologies, the reciprocity is reduced, resulting directly into more frustration. And that's why, you know, with all the dating apps out there and all the things that are out there now, the reduction of the reciprocity where people meet in person more is going to result in more frustration and more anger. So until you start to understand that, I think it I think it's um I think it's it becomes very hard to deal with. So um I think it's a privilege to be a game designer and um I just love it when people give me shit sometimes. Um because it keeps us on our toes. There was I remember when we started Dead House basically it was and he's 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 an awesome community member, his name's Golden Zan. He dove into some of the problems in multiplayer with two human, which was kind of like devil may cry meets Diablo. And I agree with them. And one of the, here's one of the conversations we got into. This is how deep the conversation got. He was like, well, how are you going to do the combat? And well, if you do this, I'm really worried about this. It, like with two human, it was very difficult. And he was right. So 
and the real problem with to human gameplay wise, there's a couple camera problems. They were really big, but in my opinion, the fundamental problem with to human is if you take Devil May Cry, which is an awesome game, in which we did, we had the same number of combos, but then you add multiplayer to it, and then you try to have combos with multiplayer. What you soon realize is all of those, um, like tap tap tap, juggle, hit hit hit. You can't do that with lag and latency in a co-op mode because it's impossible. The Twitch mechanics won't work, especially with four people in multiplayer, which we had running, though never release. And it became a bad game design issue. And if you look at something like, say, League of Legends with combos, which is a very difficult game, but I think a very well-honed game, the combos are very simplistic in nature, though hard to do. Um, and so we basically, through that analysis and speaking with him, I worked through that we weren't going to do this in Deadhouse, and that was a mistake with To Human and, you know, lesson learned. And that kind of conversation, which takes hours and hours of, you know, forum posts and going back and forth in these reduced mediums, is so rewarding. And, you know, he's he's working with us now. Uh, and he's been around for four years, and he's helping us design some of the game. It's so awesome. So I That's love awesome. it. That's awesome. That's really great. I, yeah, I recommend for game developers, next time you see a thousand of those, remember it's the medium, and it's not necessarily you. It's it's the technology, and it's how it's affecting all of society. So you know, keep your chin up. Take in as much feedback as you can and incorporate it and try to get it out to the gamers because we do work for the gamers. <laughs> I love that. Um, now, this is great because you already kind of started mentioning my next question a little bit. Um, something I, I was checking out some of your, your other interviews, Dennis, and even just in our conference call before we had this interview here today, you were talking a lot about um, the medium is the message. And I was hoping you could just really elaborate that a little bit and kind of how it translates to games and how it impacts um your approach when you know working on a new game yeah ab absolutely um the medium is the message is a famous quote from an advertiser uh, an ad advertiser called um a scholar called marshall McLuhan, and he wrote a book called the medium is the massage and the medium is the massage on the title is actually a typo. And they printed the cover with a spelling mistake. However, he believed so much that this was right that he thought people would forget it and only remember the medium is the message. And he was 100% right. And it changed advertising in the world forever. So I recommend everyone just checking that out. It's a super small book, really easy read. And so what that says is, regardless of what you're trying to say, as a creator, the medium is gonna overpower that message and that's what people are gonna get, not what you're trying to do. So first of all, that's lesson number one that we learned. Don't try to feed people a message. Try to create a world where they can get immersed and let them take in their own messages from that medium. Um, and that also says that if you're going to create things, understand your medium, knowing that there's another famous saying that if you want to know the true story, never, never listen to the teller. Okay, that's a famous, you know, film, film quote. Um, and so when we're creating Dead House Sonata, we're looking at the medium and saying, where can this go? And that's all the way back to Legacy of Cain. And let me explain. When we were working on Legacy of Cain, for the first time, this new technology came out. It was revolutionary. It was called a CD-ROM. And for the first time, there wasn't cartridges. It was revolutionary, where you could actually have real voice on something. Because when I, I loved reading, but reading on a really crappy monitor that's definitely not like today's standards where the refresh rate was low and the pixels were bulky. It was terrible reading that crap. I hated reading it. RPGs with all this text that was like, put me to sleep. I don't want to stare at my eyes are going to get red. I love these games, but a lot of times I'd be like, skip, skip, skip. I would read 
a decology, you know, for Malazan of the Fallen, but I, I did, it just didn't fit the medium yet because the technology wasn't ready. So this new technology came out and when we created Legacy of Kane, we were like, we're gonna get real voice actors. We're gonna use like Hollywood level actors for the first time ever. And I'm not gonna have any text in that game. And actually the only text in that game was on buttons and icons. And if you look for text anywhere, it doesn't exist, right? And that's because we wanted to change the medium, not change the medium, change the way people were experiencing that through taking advantage of the medium. And so for all those people who are aspiring game developers, that is my first recommendation is study the medium. So what's the medium of today? 90% of all global gaming revenues, 90% of all games is free to play online. All right, you can try to fight and you can try to resist. And hey, don't get me wrong, vinyl's still a thing with records and music, but I don't buy music anymore. I just stream it, right? And start thinking about cloud, start thinking about persistence, start thinking about deep social media integration. Some of the things I was talking about with you know, Genvid, our partners with this new streaming technology with user generated content. These are the things that are gonna lead. And by understanding the medium, I think you have a better shot at landing something that's not only original because the medium's always changing, but at the same time, you're gonna get a better shot at engaging your audience and giving them experience they didn't think was possible. So hopefully that answers the question. Great. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, now you, you actually, you, now luckily you touched on my next question, which actually has um, something to do more with uh, GDC. So I know you mentioned to us um, last week that uh, GDC is coming up and uh, you seem pretty stoked about it, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, now GDC, for those that don't know, is the Game Developers Conference um, and there's a whole scene there. And Dennis, I my question to you is, you know, who are some of the figures within the GDC scene um, whether they're indie game developers, people that have been around, critics, anybody that you would recommend um, uh, anybody check out just for the sake of learning more about games and learning more about the medium? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I would say if you're going to GDC and you're an inspiring game developer, I always recommend this to people. It's hard to get in the video games industry, right? But assuming um, you want to get in, take your favorite game creators and follow them. And um, because it's there's a reason that you like those games. There is a reason that you share some of their vision and go see their talks and get get educated on why they do the things that they do if they can explain it. And that's where I would start because there's so many different genres. There's so many, so many good people in the industry. And, you know, I've been around a long time, so I know a lot of people. I know most people uh, that have been around for a while, you know, obviously the industry is huge and stuff, but in getting bigger all the time, but I, you know, that's what I would recommend people check out. So pick your games. Uh, so, like whether it's for me, Ultima, then I'd go look for Richard Garriott or, you know, if uh, you love Nintendo, go see a talk with Miyamoto-san. If you love, uh, you know, if you love Metal Gear Solid, go try to see a talk with Kojima-san. You know, these are, these are really great. Um, there's great lessons to be learned. I, like I'm a big Mortal Kombat fan too. Mortal Kombat's, Mortal Kombat 2 is one of my favorite, but I also love, you know, huge John Carpenter fan and obviously Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, nice. A huge inspiration. I love, I just love John Carpenter. And, um, but recently, I never went to the talk, but I watched the video on their finishing system. I just love those guys. Like, I just love Mortal Kombat. The latest Mortal Kombat I thought was awesome. And um, I think there's always something to be learned from anyone, an indie developer. Like, you don't have to agree with everything but you know there's always some very interesting insights and uh yeah so but I, I would say follow the games you like first and then go see those people um and rather than try to pick who's the best speaker because it doesn't even mean anything if they're a good speaker or not 
Uh, sometimes it's just really, it's just could be something really worthwhile. I was, I was at a talk once um, in Banff, Canada, and uh, this, one of the speakers there just basically threw his talk out just before he started. And he said, you know what? I'm just going to play all the music that I like when I'm making games and tell you why I listen to these songs. That was his talk. He threw the other one out. So, so you That's never great. know what's going to happen. And uh, I think uh, there can be a lot of experience there. GDC is a great place. I think it's going to be pretty small this year because of the pandemic. It's still pretty tough mm -hmm. to get out of Canada these days. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if they're going to lift the restrictions before we get to GDC, which is in March. But um, I think next year it'll probably be back in full force. But this year it's going to be probably smaller than, than normal. Um, but right. then after that, next year after that, I think it's going to kick back in, assuming this pandemic goes away. So Right. That, that sounds like a pretty interesting talk. Are there any kind of historic um, GDC talks people could find on YouTube that you'd highly recommend? Whoa, there's tons. I, I would recommend, you know, they do have the GDC vault. Best thing about GDC is that vault. Um, get a subscription. There is an encyclopedia of knowledge there some incredibly good talks from top to bottom from uh, graphical technology, procedurally generated stories, music. Um, you know, uh, I, I think, I think there's a lot to be had there. Um, I, I, there's just so many good talks. I couldn't even imagine, but get that. I do recommend the GDC vault. I think it's fantastic. Um, and then there's a, you know, there's other conferences as well, like the Nordic conference. Very, very good. You know, um, reboot uh those are great conferences so and that's that's where the one uh the one was in banff was a reboot so uh recommend those great highly yeah, great recommendations awesome you're full of recommendations today it's book recommendations movie recommendations for for our listeners and and conference recommendations i have, we a, love I have it. a list on my phone. i like uh i like sharing uh i like sharing uh things i'm enthusiastic about and you know, if people don't like the recommendation, sorry, but I, I, it's good to try to get that stuff out there. That's great. So I think you're in the you're in the right room. I think our audience would love. I know Matt himself even will read uh, will read some fantasy books as well. So I think uh, there's some some stuff getting added to his yeah, list I keep here. A, a list on my phone of everything that I need to check out, whether it's a book or a game or a movie, and it's definitely grown. And True Detective season one is still on there. <laughs> yeah. Great, great, great uh, first season. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah. Dennis, um, you know, Lucas and I, uh, our whole lives, have grown up on the West Coast over here in the States. And everyone we talk to, for the most part, um, has also grown up in that relative area and has, you know, played similar games to us growing up. So, what I wonder is, you know, as someone who's, you know, had the opportunity to work with, obviously, like a Japan, uh, Japan based company like Nintendo or, Anywhere else, in your experience, do gamers in different countries, do they value um, the different aspects of gameplay in different ways? Well, I, I certainly think there's cultural differences between different regions. But I would say not really. Gamers like mm -hmm. good games. And um, I would say the gaming community is probably one of the best communities in the world in in the sense that it's 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 just so it's diverse across the board men women everything you know whether people are construction workers are there academics are there athletes everyone mm -hmm. plays games and totally yeah um so when i was working on legacy of kane i was actually in the u.s for quite a while um working because there's only one PlayStation dev kit at the time. And it was, it was in, uh, on the West coast. And I would go to golf land all the time, you know, to the arcades there. And back then it was into the, I had, we had a Neo Geo at the office, um, back when it was the same as the arcades. So we were playing Samurai Showdown all the time. And there used to be these tournaments at golf land. And I played a lot of Samurai Showdown and we broke like four of the controllers. <laughs> so we, Samurai Showdown two was probably one of my best, I was probably one of the best at that game, but it was one of my favorite games of all time. Another favorite game of all time, Samurai Showdown 2. And just the experiences of hanging out with the gamers in golf land, which, you know, I don't know if it's still around. I assume it is because it was pretty famous back then. You know, 
if you wanted to go play arcade stuff back in back in the Silicon Valley. And uh, I, I just I just felt that no matter where I went, Japan, you know, Malaysia, Europe. Yeah, there there were different cultural differences, but people love good games, yeah. and it's just a shared thing. And um, I I love that's what I love about gamers is um, it's just it's just a great it's, it's I guess one of the biggest communities in the world. Frankly, you know you don't have to worry about all of the other things that come into life. It's it's escapism in some ways, you know, and in, and in others it's it's something that you know, we can, you know, as human beings mutually bond together 100%. and, you know, forget about all of the crazy stuff that's out there. Yeah. I'm so glad you bring that up too. Cause totally. one of my personally, one of my most impactful game experiences was, um, are you familiar with journey it came out for the PS3? Yeah. Oh yeah. So we did that one for the podcast not too long ago. And on my playthrough, I got matched up, you know, you have like your little buddy as you're going through and I'm playing on steam. Then afterwards, um, the person I was playing with messages me on steam and they're this random person from Turkey. And we're just like talking about whatever. And it was just, uh, it was, it was like almost like a cathartic, like meditative experience, like going through that game with them. Cause obviously if you played that game, it's a very, I don't know. I just want to call that a spiritual experience. <laughs> and then just, yeah, it is chatting with this person who was from Turkey and about just whatever and about games yeah. and about our experience that we shared was just such a unique and fascinating and, experience and it was just so incredible because it is like you said it's a worldwide thing it's something that everyone can connect over you know I'm, I'm a people are people and um when you can find common ground that is something that you know we should all aspire to and i think that's what gaming can really do and whether you know i've, I've had many similar experiences from people from countries where you would never think that we would have anything in common. And then suddenly, you know, whether <laughs> I'm sp speaking or trying to speak the language they're speaking, but you can tell some of the things that people are really digging and really, really liking. And, you know, whether they're from Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, doesn't matter, South America. Um, and it's a big, that's a big thing with games. And I think it's universally... Um, universally, I think that, uh, that is fundamentally good for mankind and who knows if we ever go beyond the planets and aliens are playing video games, I'm sure we can find a connection even with, uh, extraterrestrials. So you never know. <laughs> awesome. I, I got a, a few more for you, Dennis, and then we, we won't keep you too for, for too much longer, but my question, uh, is what is your favorite non-video game game? Um, I'm interested in what you do uh, in terms of, you know, do you play poker? You know, are you into any sports what kind of things do you do? So um, I would say my favorite non video game game is Cthulhu Wars. And I spent a lot of time playing it that or Warhammer. Um, I'm a big Warhammer fan. Oh, you like Warhammer? Oh, yeah. Huge nice. Warhammer. I've been playing Warhammer. Actually, a lot of guys at Apocalypse, big Warhammer fans, um, you know, Games Workshop and um you know, I, I had like a 10,000 point Necron army. So 40 K I was huge into, I haven't, I haven't played so much, but I'm going to get into, I want to start, I love painting. And if you look on our channel, you'll see a few video just kind of back before apocalypse. I had this kind of video channel called, you know, uh, quantum uh, entertainment, quantum entanglement entertainment. And, I had painting videos for Cthulhu Wars. You can see some of the stuff I painted. It's still on, it's on the Dead House Sonata channel right now. You can actually see some of the quantum physicists I interviewed as well and spoke to. That, that is awesome. A lot of things from Dead House. But so Cthulhu Wars for board game. I love board games. And you just hasn't been, haven't been able to play them much lately because you can't sit with people. Um, I tried the online board thing. It's not the same. I love sitting down with my friends and, you know, eating, drinking, and playing a good board game. So, that's what I like a lot and used to go to the movies a lot, but you know, that's till stuff starts opening up again. It's, you know, so, but those I love. So that's what I love. So Cthulhu Wars, but there's all kinds of board games, usually strategy games I like, but Cthulhu Wars has been my favorite over the last three or four years. 
Definitely got to check yes. that one out, huh, Matt? Yes. Me and Matt are, are board gamers as well. Usually social deception yeah. games. Um, some Catan, of course. Well, yeah. Where we're um, all yeah, all, yeah. All, all, yeah, all that, all that good stuff. But yeah, I feel, um, I feel go. for game designers. We always say this: if game designers play board games and they understand what it takes to have what is a good board game, they're going to be good video game designers. So that's a that's something that we look for actually when we're. If anyone ever wants to join Apocalypse and you want to be a game designer make sure you have a good understanding of board games that'll that'll get you far so <laughs> love it uh now dennis obviously you're working on this incredible upcoming project that i know lucas and i are obviously very excited about but you know last question for you for anyone that's not familiar with dead house sonata or hasn't even heard the name dennis dyak no. or hasn't heard the name of eternal darkness or any of your previous works uh you know what would you what would you tell them about Dead House Sonata and how would you pull them out from Fortnite now from Apex and how would you pitch Dead House Sonata to them? Yeah, well, that's great. And actually, I, I realized that I hadn't even spoken about it. Um, we probably should. People will be like, "Plug your game." <laughs> so, Dead House Sonata is a narrative-driven action adventure where you play the undead fighting the living. So, you're playing vampires, revenants, ghouls, wraiths, banshees all in a world where it is so grim, you're better off being dead than alive. And we have a massive story with nine other houses. So the House of the Dead is where we're starting, but as the game develops and it is gonna be out there uh, free to play for a long time, we'll start introducing other houses like House of Giants, I don't want to say any more. Everyone's always asked me to talk about the other It already ones. sounds cool. <laughs> but the idea is to have something that's super narrative driven. So what is it? And we're going to be exploring things like um, St. Cyprian like theorized what it was, what does it mean to be dead and to what's it like to pass beyond the veil? So in a lot of games where there are games where you play the undead, once your health goes, you die. And, you know, we did that in Kane too. We're taking a different approach in Dead House. So we're, we, we look at, theories about going behind the veil and being uh what it would be like um to have you know a physical form and other essential forms and what what is true death like and oblivion essentially for the undead and what it's like to be undead so we're going to be doing some very interesting things um we released a technical demo on the o3d engine a little while ago so people can kind of get an idea of where we're going uh, we're going to be releasing a new demo uh, probably sometime in the summer. Um, and But always perpetually, we'll be working with the community to try to make it as good as we can make it. And if you watch, we have a ton of video streams, probably too many. Um, but we've been, you know, we're slowly building up to try to, um, you know, as we start, as we start building, there's going to be more and more hype. We haven't paid for any marketing or anything like that. So we're still, the community is still pretty small. But if you look at the Legionnaires, that was picked from the community. If you look at some of the things we're doing, we'll say to the community, like tomorrow's stream, as an example, um, is going to be really cool. We're going to show some of the latest things in the build, and we're going to get feedback from the community, and then we're going to fix those things up, show what we've done, and how we're getting it more towards what you know the community is asking for, and then at the same time introducing someone new, something new. So we're very community-based, and if you're looking... Uh, for a place where, you know, you can talk to the developers and have interaction as much as feasibly possible for us, we'll try. I often try to answer Discord or forum threads, and so do many of the other teams. As a matter of fact, some of the people in the company now are from the community. So we're big believers in this. So if that's what you're looking for in a game, if you want something different, if you're if you're missing that voice that has been lost in sort of deep narrative storytelling, come check out Dead House Sonata. We already have radio plays up. We have 3D books on our website that have all kinds of detailed story that's not even getting into the main story. This is just background that we've been working on. And there's also community creations in there already. And matter of fact, we've, had, we've launched several radio plays now that were written and acted by the community. So there's all kinds of things like that going on. So yeah, if you're I looking saw those. for yeah, narrative story, that's Dead House Sonata. Cool. In a in a 
in a universe where it seems impossible that there can be narrative and story, but we're going to do it. And at the same time, spiritual successor to Legacy of Kane. Dennis, uh, it's been really, really awesome um, talking to you today. And we really appreciate you coming on and, and hearing all about your latest project, Dead House Sonata, as well as your other work, Legacy of Kane, Eternal Darkness. Uh, you're truly a veteran of the game industry. Uh, games industry, you've been around for a very long time and you got a lot of stories to tell. Um, we certainly loved hearing them and uh, appreciate you coming on. Oh, thanks very much. It was my pleasure. And um, now I, you guys, we looked, we looked you guys up and it looked great. We love, uh, we love the tenor of what you guys talk about. And, you know, hopefully people will, uh, people out there listening will get something out of this. So looking yeah, forward. To absolutely. The- we're definitely checking out Dead House Sonata when it, when it drops out and we're in that discord already. So oh, we're, we're, we're dropping in. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks, Dennis.